talk the tea with Nikki and Emoji. The tea, the tea, the tea, the time, the truth, the talk. Emoji Nightmare and Nikki Champagne! This is the tea! Welcome to the tea. Two queens bringing together arts and activism. I am Emoji Nightmare. And I'm Nikki Champagne. And we have an enthralling lineup for you today. First joining us is the CEO of the Vermont Electric Cooperative, Christine Hulquist. And here to talk about her stunning artwork and murals, muralist Mary Lacey. And last but certainly not least, local folk band Cricket Blue. Yeah, they're going to perform for us too, which is exciting. They are. I'm really excited to hear what song they're going to perform. Because mm. they, they have a select few on their EPs. So yeah. Yeah, I yeah, wonder, yeah. wonder mm. which one. Mm. Mm. Speaking of performances, we have a full weekend of performances coming up. We do. It's going to be really busy and really exciting. Super busy. And I'm really hoping that it's cold, or not cold, but like <laughs> yeah. not freaking humid, because uh, my face will melt. And I don't want that to happen. No melting. No melting, Jeez. please, and thank you. It's crazy. Vermont summers are nuts. Like, we performed a couple weeks ago, and it was 74 degrees, which does not shout like Right. I it, was not prepared for uh, dying of humidity, like of like right. sweating. It wasn't necessarily hot, but it was just so sticky. humid, it's very gross. sticky. You know. But I mean, for all the viewers out there, our slew of viewers, um, <laughs> we are starting off on Thursdays at yeah. Fatal Thursdays at Social Club um, with an early and a late show and some dancing in between. So that should be super exciting. We have some New York queens coming over. Interesting. Um, and they usually turn a party out. So. Turn it out. <laughs> <laughs> and then we have Vermont Drag Idol the ah, next day. I'm so excited for this one. A lot of um, drag performers in the local area have gotten their start at Vermont Drag Idol, which is really cool because this is like the what, like 13th or 14th year that has been. It's been going on for a long time. It's legendary. <laughs> legendary. People, people look forward to it every year. Yeah. Outright definitely chose the right event to put on. It's a benefit for Outright. It is a benefit for Outright. Um, and then you have Outright duties for the rest of the year. <laughs> um, and then after that, there's a leather party over <laughs> at um, <laughs> is it? Uh, Red Square. Oh, the Burly Bear. Yes. Yeah. Nice. And the theme is Jock, I believe. Jock. Jock. Yep. With the Green Mountain Bucks. Green Mountain Bucks. Mr. So there'll be football player. Oh, we should get some Bucks players on our show. Ooh. Is that what it is? Because I definitely think it's like a leather community thing. Well, you never know. <laughs> some Bucks. What Bucks are you talking about? The semi-pro football. Oh, nope. I don't think those are the same kind Well, of anyway. <laughs> um, what kind of Bucks we'll are you talking out. about? Um, I believe it's a group. Interesting. Yeah. I thought it was a jock theme. Well, you'll find out on Friday the 21st at Red Square. At earlier. And then Saturday, <laughs> we're floating on a boat. We're going to be on a boat. Yeah, whatever floats your boat. Hosting a variety show. We were yes, at. we are hosting a variety show on Lake Champlain. Pfft, no big deal. Yeah, um, with the Vermont Pride. <laughs> hashtag popular queens. This is not our hashtag episode. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, we'll be floating along. We're on a boat. Cue the Lonely Island. Yeah. Yeah, bringing that back. <laughs> Hashtag throwback Tuesday. <laughs> oh, um, so whatever floats your boat, wear it, come yeah. on it, do it. <laughs> that escalated. Well, anyway, um, get your tickets for that at the Pride Center's website, which mm -hmm. is probably something like... Pride Center VT? Dot com dot org dot because org. it's an organization um, and it's a sliding scale and uh, pay anywhere from zero to fifty dollars. So you really have no excuse. Yep, because we want to see you there. Three floors, three awesome. floors of boat, one giant, almost Great Lake. Um, it was very close. It was. It was in the running, but <laughs> yeah, just it's too small. Size queens they are. Yeah. Well, speaking of lakes. 
let's talk about our climate and what's going on. Yeah, there. Oh, we have a dirt. Yeah, it's kind of a dirty lake, but we'll be safe on <laughs> on our boat. Um, we will. But I'm glad that we have Christine Halquist here to talk about all things environmental. Welcome, Christine. Thanks so much for joining us today. Well, thank you for having me. We are so excited, especially after having Darren Perrin on a few episodes ago, to kind of talk to you about this whole story. So that was back in 2015 when Darren released that. So there must have been a few changes that have happened. Can you fill us in? Well, you know, it's interesting. I think the world changed around me, but <laughs> I don't really feel much different other than very much at peace. You know, so it's, uh, you know, if you look at that, I, I physically transitioned December 2nd on the job. And the uh, Darren story ran in early September. It was really, I talked to Darren probably a month and a half before that, but we agreed we would release it during Pride Week. And then uh, the idea was to give the company time and everybody time, our, our members, the company's board and all that time to just adjust to the fact that this is coming. And then when I transitioned uh, Decem in December, it was kind of like a month of walking on eggshells. You know, everybody was walking on eggshells around me, but, but by January, it, started to just feel like it used to, you know, and, uh, and I was, I've been extremely well received. Um, it, I feel very supported. It's, of course, it's wonderful living here in Vermont because I also do a lot of national work. And frankly, I feel supported at the national level too, but I did hear, get some interesting uh, warnings before that transition <laughs> that I would, might lose my ability to do the work on the national level, but it turned out it didn't happen. I actually feel like I'm even doing more now than I used to. That's amazing. Yeah. So it's it's kind of interesting because being the CEO of uh, Vermont Electric Co-op, you uh, sort of you have a transition date, and a lot of people don't have um, a lot of trans people don't have a specific date that they can say I transitioned on this day um, necessarily. It's more of a process. Um, but because you were at the helm of this company, it was a little bit more. Uh, I don't know, planned? I, Plan how, yeah. Very, very planful. Yeah. I will tell you that um, it, it, my whole transition has taken probably about eight years. Right. You know, time for the family to adjust, time to get through all the, all the discussions we needed to for the family to be ready, for my friends to be ready. And then it was about starting in about uh, May of 2015, it really was moving into a business plan. So discussing like transitioning on the job, how was that experience? As you alluded to earlier, it seems like it was a pleasant experience, maybe because of this choreography that you had going on? I think the choreography was very important. I will tell you, you know, I, I, have, I, I have a kind of a funny relationship with God, you know, and I, I, I always say my God has a, has a twisted sense of humor. <laughs> um, so I have all these things that go on in life that are just funny. And one of the funny things is, why couldn't I be the CEO of a, like an artist retreat? <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah, be a CEO of the, of the most macho business around, right? So it was it was quite the challenge to think through it and figure out how to do this in a good way. And what was interesting is when I Googled, you know, about December of 2014, I started thinking about the business transition, and I Googled, okay, who's transitioned on the job as a CEO? Well, I couldn't find anybody. And then this Maxine, I forget her last name, who's the, who's the head of Sirius, you know, she's mm -hmm. a CEO of a major company, but she started the company. So mm -hmm. I really couldn't, you know, I really began to realize I was, I was uh, um, kind of treading new ground. Um, so kind of had to figure it out. Yeah, it must be your your background as the CEO probably helped you devise such a plan. Right, right. Uh, you know, because as CEO, you're always thinking about you're thinking you know three or twenty steps forward. Right, that's right. That's right. Um, and you know how every single decision is going to impact down the line. So mm -hmm. um, that's probably why it's probably a, a bit atypical mm -hmm. um, your journey probably than than most, but um, very inspiring, especially being, uh, you know, out in Lamoille County, where I'm from as well, um, rural, rural Vermont in general, it's just, it's, 
that is added to it too. Oh, rural Vermont is it, so. I was at I spent the last week at Pride in California, at San Francisco. You know, so I was out. My daughter lives in San Francisco, Jillian. So, but it's so accepted, so understood. It almost feels like it almost feels like it's a popularity contest more than anything. You know, people, and I'm really happy. A lot of straight people show up. There are a lot of allies. And, and but it's it's a festival, you know. It's got a very festive aspect, but there's still a political message. Thinking of the workplace specifically, what are some of the changes that you feel need to take place for trans workers in the state of Vermont? Well, I do. You know, it, I, I I should point out that I I do come from privilege. You know, when you think about privilege, I what I what I mean specifically is I was the CEO of the company. I I'm a, started out as a white male. You know, and and I and I have a very strong supportive family. Not everybody has that, so you know, I paint this rosy picture. I don't believe it's rosy mm -hmm. at all, and I do believe that the 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 workplace, as a, a trans worker in the workplace, should be able to go to human resources and having you know having human resource help them choreograph their transition. Now, what's interesting when you talk about human resources. I've spoken to various um, groups and, and then speaking to the Vermont Human Resource Association. There are human resource managers who, who aren't even prepared for this kind of, of situation. Now I will tell you, our human resources department, I'm very proud of them because I'm going to tell you another story is um, I, had, I developed cancer and I had stage three cancer, it was aggressive, I was sure I was going to die. I announced it to the, I told, went, I told the employees personally about this story, and the board and the employees were pretty convinced. We were all convinced I was going to die. Now, I could do that personally, but when I went to Human Resources about my transition, which was like in July, the Human Resource Manager said, well, Jesus, you told the employees about your own death. I said, this is harder than telling about my own death. That's what I told her. I said, I, I really need your help. And they did a great job of doing tremendous amount of research. Now, I believe they did that because they're a great, we have a great human resources department, mm -hmm. not because I was CEO. I think they would have done it with anybody. But it's too often I hear stories where those human resource folks don't do the research and they try to work from their own opinions and their own background and they just don't have the background for something like this I, on the whole. You know, it's something you have to research and study and help. So I don't think workers are receiving the amount of support I'd like them to receive. Who are and I and then young workers I've talked to, you know I go to the transgender identity conference every year at UVM really just to help the young folks there and and uh, too many times I hear the story of people having to leave their job, so that's happening in Vermont. Vermont is not it's a wonderful supportive state probably the one of the best in the nation, mm -hmm. um, but at the same time there's work that needs to be done I think. Something that's really resonating with me that you just said was that it was more difficult to tell your company about your transition rather than telling them that you might be dying from a disease. Like that's so difficult to take in um, and to think about. And trans is just one piece of your identity. And so I don't want to just focus on yeah, that during this yeah, interview. Um, and another piece of that is an environmentalist. You are very committed to focusing on climate change and the changes that we need to make both in our state and at a national level. Mm -hmm. um, can you tell us more about that? Yes, and that's, and I'm glad you, you, you talk about that because um, I'm, always, I'm always, you know, I, I really like the work that you're doing in making people aware of, of the struggles of, of the trans community. And I think that's highly important. My, but I, what I'll say about myself is my, I am going to, my goal is to solve climate change. You know, that's my, my life's work is to solve climate change. And I happen to be transgender. So um, it, it's, 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 you know, when you think about, I truly believe the world, we are destroying the world. And even in the next 10 years, we're already seeing catastrophic changes in climate. And I, and I know the movie, the movie is called Denial for a reason, right? Because, because uh, we have today, we have an administration that's, that denies climate change. Well, it, you know, we're only about six tenths of a degree centigrade away from the methane hydrates bubbling up from the ocean. And that's gonna cause a step function. Uh, and, 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 you know, you, people don't believe in science, you know, but, but 350, million, 350 million years ago, the exact same thing happened. 
and, you, and you're able to tell that by the, the by the ice camp ice uh, core samples. And 95% of the species were wiped out on the planet. So I believe we're going to see that happen in the next 10 years. I, I believe you know it's. I believe we're there. We're right on the precipice of a massive release of methane, which is about 80 times more dangerous than carbon dioxide. Will we survive that? Is that, is that, that sounds very dangerous. It is very dangerous, yes. Oh. I'm, I'm speechless. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, so methane, so no, no, methane like is a gas, me right? Methane is a gas, Okay. Yes. And so how is it? Uh, so are you breaking the news so, that yeah. possibly in 10 years we are going to die? This is well, not I don't know what news. the answer will be, but again, <laughs> As as a as News a, to us, a utility manager who yeah. who's very planful, right? You know we should we should be making serious plans. Should we turn these lights off? <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of lights on. I us. noticed when I came in, these are energy efficient fluorescent okay. lighting. <laughs> I mean, the LED lights are more efficient, but I, I always I'm always yeah. Observing I figured the you're always. But it's, thank you, know, you, you know, we. I will tell you from a personal standpoint. Now we'll tie it back to the transition story, right? From a personal standpoint, I know that. I personally, and I'm not very effective coming from a place of fear. Fear and anger really destroy our effectiveness as personally and as, as, a, as a species, right? So, so we don't need to fear. I mean, it, it sounds terrible, but point is plan for it, you know, take, mitigate, start mitigating carbon right away. Um, and, and that's what we need to do, regardless of fact whether our government agrees or not. So when, so when you look at uh, uh, President Trump pulling out of the climate accord, to me that's irrelevant. We can, we can and probably will exceed the requirements of the Paris uh, climate accord in spite of the government. Because it takes every, if every single one of us starts making decisions based on carbon, the marketers and the, and the manufacturers will all change how they market. They'll respond to us just like they do in California. You know, Pride was a great event. Apple was there. All these big people, all these big companies were there because right. they wanted to be there to show that they're supportive of the LGBT community. Well, same thing with the environment. If we, if we, if we st start educating ourselves and make decisions, the food we buy, for example, I'm going to buy a steak tonight. Steak is highly carbon intensive. Now. I, you know, I used to meet, eat meat every day. Now I eat meat maybe once a week or twice a week. Mm -hmm. it, meaning I'm not saying radically cut things out, just start changing. I, I now drive a, a plug-in electric hybrid, you know, transportation. Think about transportation, your home heating, all those kind of things. If we all just start thinking about it, that's how the change will occur. You know, we shouldn't be waiting for our government to change. It's just making the minor changes it, it, and you think, well, what, what, what impact do I have? I hear some critics say, well, Vermont is only two-tenths of one percent of the national population. What impact do we have? Mm -hmm. Well, you do. Every, you, see, you know, if you look, look the way mass marketing is done, it's all about our decision-making. That's how people respond. And, and you can see that, like I say, I'll go back to California and see that just marvelous support for the, the uh, LGBT community. Now we just need marvelous support for, for restoring the earth. So, speaking of being in denial, um, which we clearly are, that's the first stage of grief, yeah. um, you, your son actually produced a documentary, Denial. Yes. Um, amazing, by the way. Thank For those you. who haven't seen it, can you tell them more about it? Yes, and it's a, so it's available on, on uh, iTunes and uh, Amazon Video, as well as, you know, that you can get it on satellite. And, and on you do US. some screenings locally occasionally, right? We've done right? screenings for the past year. In fact, Memorial Day weekend, I was flown out to Spain for and met yes. and for the weekend and met with a bunch of energy activists there. It was all so it's so it's getting it's getting world recognition, but it's not it's not it's not really getting reviews or po it's not necessarily popular. But but it, the the messages are kind of, you know I'm not sure how you know how uh, mainstream the messages are mm -hmm. as 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 we're talking about transgender and climate change, right? But but. Uh, he, my son was, uh, he would go to work with me when he was in high school. I'd be go on a major outage and he'd, you know, it'd be 11.30 at night, can I go with you on this outage? Sure. And, and you know, he, he, he didn't spend a lot of time in school like others did, but, it, but, he was, but his whole goal was to do film in life, so I honored that goal. 
And uh, so then he was fascinated by the fact that, because gr all growing up, I, I would talk about climate change and I'd talk about our impact environment. I'd say to my kids, every time you throw that light switch, you're making an environmental decision. You know, just saying, you know, mm -hmm. casual stupid things you say as a parent. Um, but apparently got into the kids' heads and got into his head. And, you know, you'll see that scene in denial when he's, when he's having the child and thinking about energy. He's like, ah, you know, can't get it out of my head, the fact, energy consumption. So he always wanted to make a movie about climate change, and he managed to get some other um, fairly high-level folks involved, such as Eugene Jarecki, who's a major documentary filmmaker. But the, and, they, and they were, you know, he was filming it. It took over about a six-year period, but about three years into it, is when I told him I've got this other news. And at that point, he had discovered if there's going to be news, he's bringing the cameras along. So mm. you'll see he <laughs> filmed every major event. When I announced that I had cancer, you know, I called him. I said, Derek, can you come for dinner? He says, this is going to be as big a news as your <laughs> transgender. I said, probably bigger. I'm bringing a film crew. You know, so, he, so he would yeah. actually film his, the live reactions and the live uh, oh, changes wow. that would occur in the family. And our family agreed to do this really because it's because it, it was an important part of our life and, and maybe it can contribute to the, the, the positive evolution of humankind, right, if we, yeah. if we get these words out. So he yeah. filmed this whole transition and event. And, I, and what was amazing to me was Anoush, who's the uh, editor, she's done a lot of great movies and she's a great editor. She really was, uh, they were all really smart, but she did an incredible job of weaving together this story and connecting how a personal struggle with your gender is the same struggle we're having at the world with climate change. You know, we are in denial. Mm -hmm. And by the way, you, you, there are scenes in the movie where I talk about it. You know, this, this denial was going to kill me. Mm -hmm. And well, this did not, same thing with the planet, right? Denial's gonna kill us on the planet as well. And we, once, and humans have a hard time accepting these big issues we don't even know how to grapple with these huge issues. So we stay in denial. But once we deal with it, such as when I started seeing my transgender counselor, I never dreamed I could be as strong a leader as when I was Christine. Right. You just can't even imagine you're gonna get there when you're starting the process. Same thing with climate change. You know, How can we solve this big problem? It's huge. Well, we can, and life will be better when we get to the other side. That's really the story. But in the meantime, definitely check out Denial, the documentary, on iTunes and on Amazon. Right, yes, please. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Christine. We had a wonderful conversation, even if we're now like contemplating the next <laughs> 10 years of our lives. <laughs> <laughs> this methane, I will not sleep tonight. <laughs> right, <laughs> nightmares. Yeah. Literal and, and, You nightmares. know, you contribute a little bit to methane too, so just think about that when you eat your beans and all those things. Oh, kinds of stuff. yes, those vegetarian <laughs> meals that we Goodness. love so much. But I'm sure that's a lot better. Locally sourced and organic. So we'll survive the methane <laughs> implosion. Awesome. That's good. All right. Awesome. All right. So now that I've had the time to contemplate what's going to happen in my next 10 years of life, I'm excited <laughs> to talk about something more fun and uplifting, which is all about arts with Mary Lacey. Welcome! <laughs> ah, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. So oh, for cool. those who don't know about Mary Lacey's amazing murals, they can be seen at like deal thedealer.com, Silos, The Hummingbird on uh, the corner of uh, St. Paul, Paul and, and College. 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 Yeah. College. Okay. Well, I'm trying my best. <laughs> it's Burlington is so hard to like know streets. It's just like it's it's that one that's there next to that. Yeah, it's all the way landmark. Yeah. From the park. Yeah. It's the one by it. the hummingbird. That's what I said. Like. <laughs> yeah. It's not a landmark. Honestly. Yeah. Clearly. Uh, and you're also featured up at UVM. Mm -hmm. Everywhere. All over Everywhere. the place. Everywhere. <laughs> So welcome, and tell us about how you got started doing all these murals, um, including, by the way, in Jericho, yeah. the chicken. That was which my is first at your exterior. Place. Yeah, it was on my parents' barn. It's a chicken. It's I have. Cute. I've seen the chicken. Oh, mm -hmm. yeah. There you go. Um, I got started right after 
college, pretty much, um, though I didn't study art at all. I was interested in art in high school, um, but like I was doing small canvases and I struggled with like, I saw the purpose of it for myself, like on a very personal level, um, but I let it go because I just didn't see it at that time. Now I can, I can list off like so many reasons why <laughs> art is important, but at that time I just didn't see it yet. Um, and it wasn't until the very end of college that I, um, I was studying history and politics and I came across this, I just refreshed myself and watched it today actually to prepare for this interview. Um, it was like you're on the internet and Facebook and then you click on one thing and you click on another thing and this whole like trail ended up um, getting me to this TED talk by the Prime Minister of Albania. <laughs> okay, oh. <laughs> that's who, quite the journey. <laughs> yeah, who was an um, artist before he was a politician and he, and he brought that as like an important platform to, to politics. Um, and he just started like paint, like um, the buildings in Al Tirana, Albania were, hadn't been like kept up at all since um, the USSR departed. That's kind of how he described it. It was like this vacuum and then there wasn't any kind of upkeep and it was these gray giant buildings that were falling apart and he had no budget to actually renovate them. And um, so he just like jumped in and started painting this like gray building, this super bright orange and everybody stopped. Like and it was like this traffic jam outside of this building. Everybody like suddenly was paying attention and. He kept, he painted a lot and it just created this like, um, you know, it was this visible change, like a new um, era that they were going, people were going into. And so this, they, it really like brought this spirit of hope that, that like, um, and people just started participating in politics. They, they kind of, they, they, they felt like they could contribute. Um, and just like the uplifting bright colors. Um, so that like TED talk, in that moment, I was like, I'm gonna be a muralist, <laughs> I'm gonna do it. <laughs> I came home and um, painted a mural on my parents' barn, and which was the chicken. Um, and that was nerve wracking, cause it was like right in public. I, I made this like barrier so that nobody could see me as I was doing it until afterwards. Um, but it was cool, like they're in Jericho, um, I would not say it's known for like murals or street art and the number of people that stopped and the number of people that get out and take pictures of it or like um, people tell me like, oh every day I look for it on their drive home. <laughs> so you could see the um, well, it's, no, but it's cute yeah. because right across the village, the Clarys have their sculptures. Yeah, no, and so it's like it's creating almost like totally. this really cool little art vibe in tiny in little Jericho. Jericho Center. Every time I'm always like, oh, what does his you know letter yeah. say today? Um, it was believed for a really long time. He has these giant letters, and then. Um, yeah, just recently it switched to, to be love. Oh, cute! Yeah, shout <laughs> out to Chris Cleary. Maybe we should have him on and yeah. talking about. Uh, yeah. His his Jericho art, <laughs> but anyway, that I I do love that, and I love that that's sort of like the first. Um, that was how you started with all these mm -hmm. murals, and it's like it always goes back to the chicken, which is really cute. <laughs> that that's like in your hometown and everything. Yeah. So um, I was made familiar with you through your work with the Moran plant, mm -hmm. um, and that is a really cool story i don't know if we want to go so deep into it but um because i don't yeah. even know where that is right now um in the stages of development but um, um yeah that came right after the chicken i um some friends of mine and i like put on a huge event at my parents house my dad was a farmer he's not anymore but cattle farmer so we had a cow roast where we roasted a whole cow and um cleaned out my parents barn which hadn't happened in like 20 years and made an art gallery and so somehow the um, Moran team heard about that event and that's how I met them. I saw it as a pretty reciprocal platform. One, it was a very public place so I would be able to get my um, name out and two, like really kind of wanted to test these, these things I was reading about of like 
changing the way people see things um, or like giving that sense of hope to a space. So um, I, and I knew nobody was ever gonna, not that many people get to see it inside the Marine plant. So the final product to me was always a video, always the photos. Mm -hmm. um, so when people ask about like them, the murals themselves deteriorating, I don't feel that attached to them. I don't, you know, it's yeah, so kind the, of a temporary. So the Moran plant's like a, it was a former utility plant yeah. in Burlington right on the waterfront. Yeah. And it, now it's just sort of been uh, just there. It's just yeah. vacant. And, <laughs> and Mary did all these murals. It was like really cool. Some of them were like you were standing in water when you were painting them. Yeah, correct? I wanted to like turn on a sense of imagination in the space. So um, for me, literally that was like envisioning it as a natural habitat. Um, and the flooded basement was like a, um, to me felt like a really still pond because like the water was completely stagnant. Yeah. yeah. And, um, and when you see a heron, you kind of see a heron like across a pond. You don't ever get super close to it. Um, so I climbed down in there and like, far off where you, you know, you walk, you can walk in the basement here because it was like above the flooded area, but I, I crossed into that and like painted a heron right there. So that felt, to me, when I look back on that memory, it's like pretty exemplary of my determination. <laughs> I was like, I'm gonna do this <laughs> yeah. uh, at whatever cost. But yeah, it was like turning on a sense of imagination in there and hopefully that tr then could translate into what people could see this as like a event space or a, you know, farmer's market space or restaurants and stuff. Yeah, and they used it in all their promotion for trying yeah. to, you know, develop a plan for this space, which was cool. That's awesome. I know that we were talking about flooded basements before <laughs> coming <laughs> into did. this shoot today. We did talk about flooded so basements. So I'm glad that we could have this connection here <laughs> with the heron. Just uh, imagine herons and reeds and like herons and marsh reeds and, suddenly and like marshes <laughs> and a nice marsh in that flooded basement. Yeah. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> And your murals are so notable with the geometric designs. You mm -hmm. see them, you know that it's a Mary Lacey original. <laughs> um, so where did you get the inspiration to do these, uh, like bringing shapes. in the geometry, the shapes? When I was really little, I, was, I really liked origami. Um, so when I, first, when, I, when I was doing my first murals, I, when, in high school I painted very realistically or tried to. Um, and then when I was doing murals, somehow it, it I wanted to um, abstract it. I felt like I felt this need to abstract it in that space. Um, and I was just thinking about origami, like if there was an origami hummingbird, like what would the different planes be or where would the folds go? Mm. Um, and then I actually like, it's crazy, I look back at um, like my, my sketchbooks from when, I, even when I was young, like the, I, I really, there's shapes everywhere in there. Like, that was just a really something that I didn't notice before. <laughs> so you were, how did your, you have a connection with, was it Sherwin Williams? No. Benjamin Moore. Oh, damn. Oh, <laughs> I'm sure, I'm sure all the execs are watching. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I know. <laughs> but for a major paint company, so they, mm -hmm. you were almost like, what, sponsored by them? Yeah. And they, like, put you on tour, almost. Yeah. You so took I, your Mary Lacey van. Yeah. Um, yeah, I just got back like a few weeks ago and um, had taken off in September. I got a connection through the Vermont Paint Company in Burlington. They are their independent store and they just sell Ben for more paint. And I said, do you have like a corporate contact that would at all be interested in? At first I just wanted free paint. Um, <laughs> yeah. And they said yes to that and that they then wanted to like document it. And I said, well, one, I have my own videographer, like my, one of my best friends. Um, so you have to hire him because I trust him. Um, and two, like if you could sponsor more of, you know, pay for my gas or pay for, you know, all those things, like the co they, they covered the costs of the tour. Um, but I wasn't, I wanted to keep like control over where I went, who I worked with, all of that was in, was completely me and it was a lot of responsibility to find all those murals. Yeah, because you went to some like far out places like Alabama, right? Yeah. Um Mississippi, so far out. yeah. <laughs> but like literally yeah, like, no, how does, they like, were... a little, like how do you connect with a yeah with a place in, in Alabama to do these <laughs> like random, you know um 
I never did one in Al- Al- Alabama, but oh, it, Mississippi. Mississippi was, really, what's yeah. the difference? <laughs> geography. Should we get into this? Yeah, we did yeah. the whole geography thing before. We, we have won't some do difficulties. That. It's prob- that's what geography. they say about New Hampshire and Vermont. Yeah, so I'm sure that, know that Vermont's down there on they it. get yeah. pretty defensive about yeah, it. Probably. Like we were. <laughs> so in Mississippi. Um, yeah, they. Every single mural um, there has been eight so far. I have one left in Bethel, Vermont. Um, but every single mural was completely different in, in terms of how it got organized. Um, but often I just was, was a lot of cold emails, cold calls, and just you know telling my story, saying like, um, do you want a free mural? <laughs> <laughs> but I would reach out to, organi- I would research and find organizations or community organizers that um, I really admired or thought, you know, from what I researched on them, mm-hmm. and just people that were really committed to their community, um, and that was a com- wide range. It was arts organizations, youth organizations, um, a small business in Savannah that was a used art store, art supply store. Um, totally different across the board, um, and just one by one they all kind of fell into place but it was it was incredible it was like and and I started to really um, as the organizing went on uh, feel like I really wanted to go to smaller places and and um, one because I'm from a small place I felt kind of the um, I felt more comfortable there um, and I also just allowed for like this randomness or like I mean yeah I mean obviously you probably found these places like you're you found the TED talk from the Prime Minister of Albania yeah you're just like you you slowly (laughs) can get anywhere yeah (laughs) and um I mean I like doing a mural in Albania (laughs) one day I really want to go there (laughs) Um, make it happen Benjamin Moore (laughs) (laughs) and they were random but they um were like consistent with these uh, just national issues that were going on like um, I was in Greenville Mississippi a couple you know for two and a half weeks or something um, I left just like the day before the election and I was in an African-American community there and there was a church burning of an African-American church um, five blocks from where I was working and it said vote Trump you know they spray paid vote Trump on it and to me, you know, it was like to see these national. Yeah, was that like that was picked up by national news? Yeah. Right? Okay. Um, but there had been, you know, there had been m- many, many prior yeah. that hadn't been picked up by national news in that specific in that in Greenville. Nobody else around me was surprised by that. Mm. Um, I think just now that news can spread so fast. Yeah. Like, uh, yeah, and it seems like you're getting a strong connection with these different communities that you're coming into, whether mm-hmm. it's because they're these small communities that you're used to, yeah. or it's the same as coming back to Vermont and supporting those youth communities or those community organizers that you were talking about earlier. Yeah. And speaking about bringing it home, you recently did a fundraiser for Outrage Vermont yeah. um, with beautiful t-shirts of the state of Vermont. Can you, For those who haven't seen it, what is the design on there? Um, it's a state of Vermont, but it's also a um, map of Burlington. So I kind of looked at like the Google Maps or a map and made a shape for every block, for every city block, um, and then just cut that line like mm. around the Vermont. Um, and it's from a design that I did like a year and a half ago um, for the recycling containers for CSWD. Oh, yeah. Art, um, yeah, yeah art, art recycling. recycling. Yeah. So that was, I mean, that the map of on there covered, like, when you, you know, it was like, mm. didn't have the outline of Vermont, but um, that's where that came from. And I, yeah, I just, um, I did it as, I was nominated for the Seven Days Artist, and I just, I felt like, I don't know, I feel like here I've been given a lot of chances, a lot of risks, a lot of support. Um, people have taken a lot of risks on me, you know, as, a, as I was fresh out of, or just new to everything. Um, yeah. 
and I just feel really grateful. So I just felt like it was a great campaign. Doing a, you win. something out of gratitude. <laughs> Yeah. And we'll I mean, see you at the not... Daisies Awards. Uh, that's the good news. Have you been to the Daisies Awards no. in August? No. So hopefully you're a winner, and hopefully you have a sash, and hopefully we get to take a picture with you there. And hopefully, how much did you end up raising um, during that campaign for Outright? Um, I thought, I think it's almost $2,000. It's amazing. amazing. Yeah. yeah. Um, I need some help with the too. math, but... <laughs> Math is hard. I mean, we can't do geography, we also can't do math. So, but we definitely look forward to celebrating mm -hmm. at the Seven Daisies Awards with you. And we're so happy that you were able to join us today to talk about all things art. And activism. And activism. <laughs> Thanks, Mary. Yeah. Thank you. We have our next guest here, Laura Huberlin and Taylor Smith from Cricket Blue. Welcome. Hi. Thank, Thank you, for you for having us. us. You Thank owe me you. a Coke. Oh. <laughs> oh my goodness. Is it one of those Cokes that say like share with? Yes. Yeah, share Make with. Make it specific. Taylor. Share Make it hard her. for her. Like, yep. oh. I need, yeah, I want one that says with your friend. Yeah. They have those cheesy. Go find it. Share with your okay. friend. Go find it. Yeah. So. Well, so. thank you so much for joining us. We're so excited to have you on today. I love your feathers. Oh, thank you. They're so cool. Thanks so much. And I love your flannel. <laughs> it's pretty awesome. I worked hard on it. You did. Did you make it yourself? No. Oh. Well, mm. you picked it out, and that's all that matters. Aww. So Speaking of. Speaking of style, let's talk about how you got interested in music to begin with. Well, I... I uh, have been interested in music most of my life. My family was very musical when I was growing up. My dad plays trumpet and my mom plays violin. And I have a sister, a younger sister, who plays piano. And we all sing. And it was just a normal part Did of Did you have a family life. band? Well, not an official one. Uh, not that played shows, but uh, most car rides, rides yeah. were a family band experience of sorts. So kind of like the Jackson 5 on family trips. It's a lot, yeah. <laughs> or the Von Trapps. Oh, is that, is something we got a do lot. Do you do hiking and sing while you're hiking? <laughs> I don't think we ever have. Do you drive while trumpeting? No. Okay. That's unsafe. Yes. Yeah, that, <laughs> that, that, that might even be illegal. I don't know. I haven't seen stickers for it, so it must be good. <laughs> That's allowed. That's how you get most yeah, of not a sticker. law information yeah. from yeah. stickers. Awesome. So, so it's, it's a family, family affair. affair. It's a family that affair. Way. I had no choice in the matter. Oh. I was <laughs> destined. <laughs> What about you? Yeah, well, I have also been playing music from a very young age. Less um, three-part harmony car singing with my family, <laughs> but definitely, if you asked me what I wanted to be when I was in second grade, I would have said um, a singer or a writer, and now I am a songwriter, so it all worked uh, You're living all your dream. I am living my dream, yeah. Wow. <laughs> so, speaking of songwriting, you have a new EP out. And it's not, it may be two letters, but it's pronounced I-O as in a name. It's a name. That's it's right. a name. It rolls right off the tongue. It's been out for a little while, right? Like last year? Was it mm -hmm. last year? Yes, it's been out for a year, a little over a year now. Yeah. And it is called I-O, which is a Greek myth about um, a woman who gets turned into a cow by Zeus to uh, hide her from his wife. Oh, was she one of the mistresses? She indeed was, yeah. yeah. That's a kind word for it, an, <laughs> un an unwilling mistress. Zeus pursues her <laughs> through the dark woods and, uh, and he catches her, but Hera knows Zeus's wife, Hera, has yep. an idea that he's up to something, so. Well, because Zeus has covered the whole area in clouds to kind of hide what he's doing. Oh. And Hera's backfires. like, these clouds don't seem normal. I think my husband is up to something. So she descends through the clouds to find him just hanging out with a cow. He turns Io into a cow to cover up the fact that he was with a, a lady. Um, but then Io gets stuck as a cow for a while and goes on all sorts of uh, cow, cow adventures. adventures. Oh, that's cute. Sadly, that's cute. Like cow so now you owe me a coke? Just saying. Exactly. <laughs> so, transitively, you're going to give me a, a coke and I'll pass oh, it on. Oh, okay. perfect. Wow. Right. You get out of it so easy. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, we tend to love to talk about cows on this show. We do. We, had we a talked about cow bingo. We talked 
We talked about methane and cud. <laughs> and cud. Which is wow. The most interesting yeah. Thing so about we have a lot of we have a lot of connections here on the show. Yeah. And so Thanks for contributing to that. Of course. <laughs> Feel very at home. Yeah. Good. <laughs> so so why that piece of mythology? Why why was that the focus of? Hmm. Well, we were writing about a lot of characters. I mean, there are only four songs. We were writing about four characters who um, were kind of victims of circumstance and had some kind of gender power things happening. Um, and so we like felt like... Deprivation of agency. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a big thing. Yeah. She didn't ask to get turned into a cow. Right. It's just sort of collateral mm -hmm. damage, so... Yeah, she is still able to write her name with her hoof because it's just I O. Oh. So. <laughs> now is this another coke? Because you put it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Was wow. that part of the mythology is that she was able to write it? Yeah. So mm -hmm. she she can't oh. communicate I know to nothing people about Greek mythology. who she is. Um, she goes on all these cow adventures that are not fun for her though. No, it's they're they're arduous. kind of adventures of sorrow. Yeah, she's stung by flies and she's in prison. Cow prison? Oh. She's, oh, she's, watched, with she's watched by a, a demon. Yeah. And she finally oh. uh, finds her dad, who's a river god of some mm -hmm. kind, but she can't speak or explain to him who she is. And he's weeping because he thinks his daughter's gone forever, but then she, she writes her name in the sand with her hoof. Yeah. Which is, of course, upsetting to her father, who was like, I had all these great plans that you were yeah. going to marry a man, and now you have to marry a cow. So... I wonder what a cow marriage looks like. Oh my gosh. I'm I am going to officiate one. That's, that's a life goal. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> so it seems like Greek mythology is an inspiration for the name. But mm -hmm. what are some of your musical influences when it comes to writing songs? Oh, I would say, at least for me, Anais Mitchell is a big influence because she does a lot of character writing um, that I, I like. Yeah, um, I like Joanna Newsom a lot, and uh, Sufjan Stevens. Mm -hmm. I think we also get a lot of influence from classical music in terms yeah. of song structure. It's a little bit more meandering than your average pop folk song. And so you were like, how did you meet? Because I think you were doing peasant dramatic, which was like your wow, drop that, which was <laughs> like, <dug> that <laughs> which was like your, it was just like just you, yeah. but under a, that moniker. That's true. And then you were like, how did that whole? I I discovered you through like the Grace Potter Grand Point North. <laughs> like you went like you had a viral campaign to get you to play with on that festival, right? Ah, uh, well, I wouldn't call it viral, well, but I mean, um, you were like in the running, running right? <laughs> you? I was, yes, I was in the running. Yeah, we um, we became friends at college. We both went to Middlebury College, and um, we were both doing solo show things then. So I was mm -hmm. performing under my name. Taylor was performing as the Peasant Dramatic. It's a name I haven't heard in a long time. <laughs> <laughs> and um, when we graduated from college, we were doing all of these kind of two-hour shows and neither of us really had two hours of music we wanted to perform so we kept splitting shows and then you know we'd be like do you want to do a couple of songs together and then eventually that got to be a larger and larger part of the set so that's cool i didn't know that yeah, yeah. oh cute <laughs> um and so you've been performing together since like when it's been it's about and a half it's about it'll, it'll four be years fall. yeah no this month Four years. That depends. Four I guess years. when you start the timer. Because well, there was this gray area. Well, when we started performing under a name, it was four years ago. Gotcha. <laughs> you put out two EPs. Yes. Mm -hmm. And you have been... Did you do the Tiny Desk or did you apply to do the Tiny Desk? We've, we've, we've yeah. Entered the contest. Entered okay. the contest like a couple of times. Like most people do. It's like That's a rite of passage, right? Yeah. 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 No, that would be very cool if we could play the Tiny Desk. Well, I'm desk. sure NPR's watching. watching. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I'm oh, sure... Bob Boylan, yeah. if you are... This is a very are... popular show. Yeah. 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 <laughs> you know. We have such a following. <laughs> yes. Why? <laughs> Practically national at this point. I mean, it's oh, I'm sure. I'm sure. Our goal is to go global, but we'll get there eventually. <laughs> <laughs> global. Um, so, did you two have a similar style of music when you were performing separately yet together, or did you like mm. mash in your two different styles? Yeah, it's definitely evolved over time yeah. a little bit. 
Um, my style was a little bit more similar to what we do now. Taylor's kind of curbed his uh, his style toward toward mine. Yeah, that sounds right. For the band, mostly but, because I can't sing that loudly. Taylor can sing very loudly, and he used to. <laughs> dramatically, you mean? Yeah, peasant, yes. peasantly, dramatically. Peasantly. <laughs> Uh, Double yeah. adverb, definitely <laughs> dramatically. I <Yeah>. like. <laughs> what do you think the band's style has now become a thing that's pretty different from anything we were doing mm -hmm. beforehand? Though. Yeah. Yeah. Especially with the the harmonies that like changes the the feeling of a lot of things. Yeah. You're great harmonizers. Yeah, Thanks. thank you. <laughs> so, in harmonizing, do you have a favorite song or album that you two have recorded? Well, I mean, we're definitely most excited about the EP we released last year. Yeah, IO is, yeah, better <laughs> than our first one. Um, we're most excited about all the songs that we have now. We, we have a bunch of new songs and we'll probably play one for you later um, that will hopefully go on a full length in like the not too distant future. That's Ooh, what we're excited about. But no, no like, uh, promises on the date. It's a lot of work. No release yeah. date, no name yet. Correct. Neither of those yeah. things. <laughs> working title. No working title. No. The no, you're not going to drop anything. I have working see. titles in my mind. Of course oh, he does. Okay. Those are the secret ones. <laughs> yeah. No exclusive drop here on the T. Did anything? Right. We'll come back when it's at. Yeah, done. that sounds oh. like a plan. Yeah. Okay. Um, I love that. <laughs> so where are, can folks catch you upcoming in the Burlington area? Oh, we've got a few shows. Um, starting Thursday, we will be playing in Shelburne at Shelburne Vineyard um, nice. as a benefit for the Pride Center of Vermont. Um, and then when, wait, Friday, Thursdays? Th this? this coming Thursday. So Thursday, which, July the 6th. Uh, which this will air after that, though. Oh, well, okay. So we have three that we shows played. that will. And it was a fantastic <laughs> show. So we, many we people played on the sixth, the seventh, and the eighth. It was sold out. I mean, all three. Uh, yeah. When when is this? This will air? air on the eleventh. Okay. Great. Well, we'll be playing the no. We'll Saint be playing Albans. in New York, and then Philadelphia, and then Cambridge, and then St. Albans. We'll be in St. Albans on the fifteenth of uh, July. Yes, and we'll also be, we'll be back in Burlington playing Sidebar on the 27th? Yes. Yeah, it's a Thursday, and we're playing with a band called Western Den, or the mm. Western yes, Den, and we're they're so very good. good. Yeah. And you guys do a great job with your email marketing, so <laughs> if folks can, folks can find out where you're playing by signing up for your mailing list, just saying. True. That is true. Which yeah. you can find on our website, cricketbluemusic.com. We'll put it down. <laughs> and um, <laughs> and I like that you also like you tailor your emails to be very. They're not. They're just every once in a while, and they're great. They're personal, and thank you. Yeah, we, you they're... do. I just want to applaud your email marketing. <laughs> Thanks <laughs> very much. Yeah, it, we we don't want to bombard anybody with irrelevant emails. So. <laughs> It's much appreciated. <laughs> <laughs> well, can you bombard us with some music now, though? Because Absolutely. I would love to hear your beautiful voices. What will you be singing for us today? We're going to be playing a song called Quiet, Quiet. which is not yet recorded. So this is making its debut. <laughs> it's okay, perfect. Your debut performance. Uh -huh. Well, you obviously performed it before, I'm sure. <laughs> That's true. You were never on television. <laughs> television First debut. Televised. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Mm -hmm. So we might not get the new album, but we certainly get a new single. Mm -hmm. Great. Nice. Um, well, <laughs> let's transform our VCAM studios for the Cricket Blue performance. Ah. <laughs>
Amazing! Quiet by Cricket Blue! Thank you so much for performing for us today. Thanks, Thanks so for much having for having us, having us on. And oh, by the way, congrats on your seven date. You get nominated for a Daisy, right? We got nominated, so <laughs> fingers yeah. crossed. We were just talking to Mary Lacey about she was nominated as well, so hopefully we'll see you at the party in yeah. August. Great. The nominees are going to come to party, right? Yeah, yeah of course. Right. Unless of course. they have a gig. <laughs> Unless you have a gig, which is way more important. We definitely understand. But we're so glad that we had you here today. And we're so thankful for all of our guests that we had. Um, definitely give us some feedback on our website, nightpain.com. And as always, tune in every week, Tuesdays at 7 p.m. on VCAM. See you next week. Bye. Bye.